Hey there, I'm Cassidy Cash. I'm the host of the podcast, That Shakespeare Life. Here on DIY History, we get hands-on with the history we'll learn about on the podcast. And this is the channel where we explore games, recipes, and crafts from the life of William Shakespeare that you can do yourself at home. If you like DIY and Shakespeare history, then this is the place for you. Hit that like and subscribe button because we're here every Saturday. Hazard is a game played with two dice. It's very similar to craps, which is popular here in the U.S. and other parts of North America. Hazard was a dice game mentioned by Chaucer in his Canterbury Tales, and as a big fan of Chaucer, William Shakespeare also mentions the game in his plays. Now, in addition to being a big fan of Chaucer, Hazard was a dice game popular during Shakespeare's lifetime, which is very likely why the Bard includes it in his works. Today, I am going to share with you a little bit of history about the game of Hazard and give you all the instructions you need to try this game out for yourself. Let's get started right here on DIY History. In Shakespeare's Richard III, the title character includes a reference to the game of Hazard in his famous My Kingdom for a Horse speech in Act 4, I'm sorry, Act 5, Scene 4. Richard declares, I have set my life upon a cast and I will stand the hazard of the die. Hazard here is a reference to an early English dice game that was played using two dice. The second senator in Timon of Athens also mentions the dice game in Act 5, Scene 4, when he says, And by the hazard of the spotted die, let die the spotted. Now, he's using that as a metaphor, but again, it is a metaphor based on the game of hazard. There are 44 total uses of the word hazard in Shakespeare's plays, but with all of these, He's using the word hazard to refer to risking a loss or taking a gamble. All of these meanings can be associated with the dice game because the game is entirely a game of chance. If you're into linguistics, you'll find it interesting to note that the term hazard has been, by some scholars, attributed to French and Arabic origins from words that mean to play at dice. And there is a lot of history and scholarship that has backed the idea that using the phrase, I'll hazard a guess, or I'll take a chance on something, comes from this dice game. Regardless of how we arrived at the term itself, the game was popular in Shakespeare's lifetime. And if you'd like to try out a piece of Shakespeare's life for yourself, then here's what you need to play it. You will need to have two standard dice. These are the little dies that are squares with, you know, one through six on the outside. The basic premise of the game is that you guess ahead of time what number you think you will throw, and then you throw the dice. If it comes up that number, you win. In the game of Hazard, any number of people can play, but only the person throwing the dice gets to throw the dice at a time. So you got one person that's throwing the dice and other people can play. The non-dice players will win or lose based on placing a bet as to how successful the dice thrower is going to be. The thrower is winning based on how successful he is at throwing what is called his main. A main is the number that he picks and you can only pick between five and nine. And that's the number that he hopes to throw. Now, there were several sources that went into investigating the rules for this game. And some versions say the thrower simply chooses a number between five and nine to be his main. Other versions suggest that the dice get to choose and the caster has to throw the dice over and over again until until they toss a number between five and nine. Once they toss a number between five and nine, that number becomes their main, and then that's the one they're chasing after for their throw. When you play this game at home, you can choose which version you would like to use when you play, and that will likely depend on who you're playing it with. In a classroom, for example, where you might be crunched for time, just letting the player choose a number might make more sense, because it can take several throws before you toss something between five and nine but you can pick which version you prefer. Once you have established the main, the caster then throws the die to see if they get their main. If they throw the number they picked, then they win. But that's not the only way to win this game. Of the mains from five to nine, there are other companion numbers that go along with them to help you win. So you will win if you throw the number of your main. So if you pick five and you throw five, you win. That's the same with the other numbers between five and nine as well. If you throw what you called, you win. 
But if your main is a six, you will win if you throw double sixes. So you'll also win if you throw a 12. With sevens, you'll win if you throw a seven or if you throw an 11. Eight wins with an eight or a 12. And nine wins with a nine. So only five and nine are, if you're there, your mains, you can only win by throwing a five or a nine. With the other numbers, six through eight, they have companion throws that will win for you as well. Now, you can also lose on your throw. This is a gambling game, after all. The caster loses when they throw aces or deuce aces. These are dice game terms for throwing two ones. You may have seen a few movies where they call this throwing snake eyes. And if you throw a two with a one, so you've got a total of three showing, then that is an automatic loss. So snake eyes or throwing a three you automatically lose. You can also lose if you call a main of a five or a nine and you throw an 11 or 12. Remember, 11 and 12 are companions to the other numbers, so they don't play nice with five and nine. Or if you call a main of six or eight and you throw an 11, or if you call a main of seven and throw a 12. Those are also ways to lose. Now, these are a lot of numbers I'm throwing at you here, so don't worry about remembering all of that or jotting it down quickly while I'm talking. I have a free download that lists all the ways to win as well as an outline of how to count the bets all available in the show notes. So you can just print that and follow it while you play. Now, you may have noticed that with all the wins and losses available to you, it doesn't use up all the possible dice combinations. You could throw a four, for example. And what do you do if you throw a four? Well, here's how you handle something other than the ones we've already identified. Any other throw besides the clear wins and losses is called a chance. And when you throw a chance, you're on the cusp of losing, but you have one more throw to determine the game. If you can throw the dice and turn up that number again, so if you throw a four, you get to throw again. If you throw another four, you automatically win. If you throw the dice and you turn up the number you called originally between five and nine, your main, if you throw your main during a chance throw, you automatically lose. Now, if you throw your dice and you don't turn up a four or your main, you get to keep taking chances until you either throw your chance number you got it first or you throw your main for a clear win or a loss. Once the caster has either won or lost, the dice are then passed to the next player. Now, here's one variation that I found in my research about this game. There were some historians who said that if the caster loses instead of winning, then the caster is allowed to keep playing until they have either won or they lose three times in a row. Once the caster loses three times in a row, then he has to bow out of the game and pass the dice to the next player. Again, here, you can choose which version you prefer. But that's it for this week. That's how you play the game of hazard that is mentioned in Shakespeare's plays. For a free download of a table of how to win the game, check out the show notes for today's episode. There's also some bonus history over there about the game of hazard and a link to the sources I used for today's episode if you'd like to explore the history of this game further. Now, if you would like a complete printable guide to the entire game with step-by-step instructions, all the ways you can win, and a table that outlines how to pay out bets, including some of my own tips on how you can take this game into a classroom or play it with kids where you might not want to bet real money, that entire game guide is available for patrons of That Shakespeare Life. You can access this entire guide by joining at the digital downloads level or higher at patreon.com slash That Shakespeare Life. Thank you for playing this game along with me this week. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.